Good morning. Good morning, everyone, as we're welcoming you in this morning. As the International Health Commission of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, we are celebrating 30 years of service, and we're so excited uh, to share uh, this 30-year celebration with you and so excited to celebrate what the Lord God has uh, worked through us and in us as we're committed to doing his work today. Uh, we're, again, we're just giving an opportunity as everybody is being moved from the waiting room into the active area. We are also streaming live on Facebook. Um, also at this time, I'll need to ask Reverend Dr. Burnett to make me a co-host again, a co-help host so that I can uh, share my screen. But again, welcome to everyone. Um, I almost want to say good morning, but I know that it may not be morning in your area. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We're just happy that you're here with us. Amen and amen. We just thank God for each and every one of you. So at this time, I am able to share my screen. Just give me a second here. And as we uh, get started with our, our program or our, our town hall this morning, again, we thank God for the opportunity as we shared with you that we are sharing and our theme is lifestyle medicine is faith in action. And you're gonna hear more information about exactly what that means during this virtual town hall. We're also recognizing the fact that July is faith-based health, wellness, nutrition, and fitness month. During this town hall, some of you will have the opportunity, well, everybody has the opportunity, but some of you, your name will be called out as we are giving away a healthy gift and a safety gift. We're going to have a fitness moment for about five minutes using a nutrition facts label scavenger hunt for healthy food. So that's gonna be fun opportunity for you to stand up and move around. And then we're gonna invite you to join us in a 30 day AME Culinary Rx Lifestyle Medicine Challenge. Um, and why 30 days? Because we're, felt we're celebrating 30 years. So we are gonna share more information with you about that. But as we move along um, in our program, um, want to share this short video with you. Technical difficulties, let's see if it will play. Here we go.
time, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the chair of the International Health Commission of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, Bishop Francine Brookins, uh, to give our welcome. Greetings and welcome once again to everyone. We are so glad that you are here both to uh, commit yourselves to a healthier lifestyle and also to help us celebrate and honor those who have been on the wall doing the work of the Health Commission of the African Methodist Episcopal Church for 30 years, changing lives, saving lives, getting on people's nerves in order to make sure that we stay alive. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm excited about how this program will unfold. And I think I'm supposed to pass this off now to the awesome medical director, Dr. Miriam Burnett. Before we have Miriam um, Burnett come, I did wanna recognize our partner um, in this event, the Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition. Um, their executive director is Ivanka Hall and our partner in working on the Cleveland, Ohio nutrition facts labeling menu disclosure is Dr. Lachelle Pugh. And so we're sharing information and we thank you. We thank them so much for their awesome partnership in this event. And now, as Bishop Brookins said, we'll have our opening prayer by Reverend Dr. Miriam Burnett, our medical director. Greetings all, let us pray. God, we're thankful for an opportunity to come and celebrate. We're more thankful that we have life, breath, and health that you provide for us on every day. We thank you for the opportunity to serve. Now, God, as we celebrate 30 years as a connectional organization, we do not fail to remember, remember those who came before the 30 years, Dr. Leonidas Berry, uh, Sister Gwen Williams, Dr. Chiquita Fai, before the, or the Health Commission was recognized. So God, we thank you for their leadership and what we have been able to do throughout the years. Now, God, as we move through this worship experience through learning, we ask that you uh, be with us, guide us, and direct us. Amen. Amen. And we're so excited to have a member of the Third Episcopal District a Young People's Department. We affectionately call it the YPD. Angelicia Clayter will read our scripture. Hello, I will be reading James chapter two, verses 17 through 26. Even so faith, if it has, hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say thou hast faith and, have, and I have works, so me thy faith without thy works, and I will sow thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But with thou know, O vain man, thou faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. Seeth though how faith walked with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God and was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by work. I don't want to up because there's more trash there that will bring more violence and the curse. Lisa, you've been muted. There we go. Likewise, also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and has sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. May God add a blessing to the hearers and doers of his holy red word. Thank you so much, Elise, for reading that for us. And she's played a very instrumental role in also our Cleveland, Ohio Nutrition Facts 
uh, labeling uh, program, which we'll talk about a little bit more um, in this town hall event. At this time, as I prepare to introduce um, our special guest speakers and experts in lifestyle medicine, you're gonna see that they are medical doctors. And so lifestyle medicine doesn't exclude medical doctors and our health professionals, but what lifestyle medicine does, it, it, it tells us about our role in our healthcare because sometimes that's where we're missing it. We um, sometimes don't partner with our healthcare professionals. And so lifestyle medicine, why it is faith in action, as you look at this circle, you'll see a continuum, a whole process of what it takes for us to walk in that wellness and health that we desire. So as you're looking at this uh, screen that I have, you'll see that it's, it involves lifestyle medicine in the faith-based community involves faith and prayer, nutrition, having your own garden at your church or at home, managing stress, daily fitness and movement, healthy relationships. Um, if you drink, limiting the amount that you drink of alcohol, not smoking, rest and sleep, self-care, and of course, laughter and joy. You know, the Bible tells us that what? Laughter is good medicine and it certainly is good medicine. So we wanted to make sure that we laid the groundwork for you so you understand this term of lifestyle medicine because you're gonna hear so much more about it, not only today, but you're gonna hear more about it because this is moving through our medical profession. This, this theme and topic is moving of lifestyle medicine uh, throughout the uh, medical schools. And so with that said, I'd like to introduce again, our experts in lifestyle medicine. First, I'd like to introduce for you, Dr. Columbus Baptiste. And Dr. Columbus Baptiste, lifting up a few uh, excerpts from his bio, he is an interventional cardiologist, completed his training in 2006. And since that time, he has performed thousands of heart procedures and interpreted thousands of heart-related tests. He says in his bio that on August the 12th, 2010, he watched his father pass away from the ill effects of diabetes. Eight months after, his wife's father passed away from kidney failure as a result of high blood pressure. In both these incidents, he realized his two role models in life not only had their lifespan cut short, but their health span, they spent the rest of their years, as he says, a shell of themselves. They became another victim, the doctor says, of the persistent health disparities and statistics in the larger war against lifestyle-mediated chronic diseases. So the doctor decided, Dr. Baptiste decided, that their death would mean something to others that he treated. So through research about the power of lifestyle to treat chronic diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, and stroke, the leading cause of death in the United States and disproportionately in African Americans became his mission. Through the support of many, he studied the field of lifestyle medicine and he's on a crusade to educate and empower patients to enact change and defeat these defeatable diseases, thereby extending their lifespan. Since 2010, he has lectured across the United States in local community health initiatives and cooking courses and one-on-one -on -one coaching as a part of his practice. And most recently, on July the 1st, 2022, Dr. Baptiste was a key speaker at the Essence Festival in New Orleans. Our next expert speaker who will speak after Dr. Baptiste is Dr. Scott Stoll. Dr. Dr. Scott Stoll is the founder of the Plantrition Project, the International Plant-Based Nutrition Health Conference, the International Journal of Reversal and Prevention, and the Regenerative Health Institute, a unique collaborative project with the Rodell Institute that integrates a regenerative vision for human health, agriculture, and the environment. He is a member of the Google Food Lab, serves on the advisory board for Whole Foods for their healthcare clinics, serves as a member of the Whole Foods Scientific and Medical Advisory Board. Dr. Stoll is also the chairman of the board for the Plantation Project. Every year, Dr. Stoll hosts the very popular one-week health immersion. This total health immersion takes place in Florida and helps attendees to restore, optimize their health and overcome addictions and develop a sustainable regenerative lifestyle. In addition to authoring several books, including Your Next Bite, numerous scientific articles, 
Dr. Stoll has appeared on national shows, including the Dr. Oz Show, 2018 special, Food as Medicine, and numerous doc, doc, documentaries, including e Eating You Alive, Waiting Until It's Free, and The Game Changers. As well as being a published author, he also is a member, he also was a member of the 1995 Olympic bobsled team, and he's a sought after international speaker. As we said earlier, his passion is spent in empowering physicians, healthcare professionals, individuals, and families to discover the keys to an abundant life unhindered by disease through a healthy, plant-based or vegan lab lifestyle by equipping individuals through his teaching, his writing, and cultivating networks, inspiring organizations, and providing health-based education in his variety of services so that others can grow. At this time, I would like to welcome Dr. Columbus Baptiste. Dr. Baptiste, are you there? I'm here. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning to you. And so, Dr. Baptiste, uh, we're looking for you to share with us how lifestyle medicine is, is improving patient care globally. Yes, yes. Well, one, it's a privilege to be here with you all today, and, and it's an honor, and I thank you for the invitation to address you this morning. And, you know, one, first, I want to acknowledge the the theme that you set out. And it's so powerful as you relate to the aspects of prayer or meditation, exercise or activity, love, real food, the intimacy of relationships, the importance of sleep, of humor, and all the other uh, confounding issues is so important and so uh, to our, our, our journey in this health journey there. But you know, today I was asked to kind of speak about really what equates to the Great Commission. Uh, you know, in, in, in scripture, uh, Christ told the disciples, he said, go and make disciples of all the world, right? And so what's one of the things that he did first is he went out and he healed. If you look throughout scripture, Christ healed first as he, as he ministered to individuals. And that's what we're called to do. And that's what I'm called to do. And so I, it's a privilege to be here. So let me go ahead and share my screen if I'm able to. I'm not sure if I'm able to, if you all can give me access to it. And if not, then I'll just speak to some of the things I put together as we speak on the international level of the impact and the power of lifestyle and what's happening right now. Let's see if that comes through. If not, well, I'll go ahead and I'll just speak to it in general. It's, oh, here we go. All right. Technology, you have to love it, right? It's uh, always timely. It happens just when it needs to. Let's put this here. All right. I trust that you're able to see my screen here as we go ahead and uh, persist. And we talk about the global need for lifestyle medicine. And what I'll tell you as we um, venture into this topic here briefly is, you know, the problem that's on a global scale is no different than the problem that we see here locally. You know, each of us in the lifestyle realm has taken on a certain burden. And so myself, you mentioned this in my bio with the experience of my father who passed away from the ill effects of diabetes and my father-in-law who passed away from the ill effects of high blood pressure both statues inside of our, of our uh, individual families from my wife and myself. And so we see this pervasive throughout the uh, communities of color and disparate communities. And we've really seen this come to light and bear the light over the past several years during the COVID outbreak. But this has been something that's been persistent. But it's not just here in America. We see the same sort of scenario exist and persist throughout the entirety of the world. We see that half of the world's population still lacks access to, uh, to, to health services. That we know that, that even the, the tipping point is that 100 million people, they fall into extreme poverty due to health expenses. What that means is that when they finally seek this care that they've been, been devoid of, they've been missing, that now they, they're burdened with the expense. And this is around the world, the world, world uh, Health Organization has kind of put forth in terms of the knowledge of this. And so in many low and middle income countries, it's the chronic or non-communicable. Now, what that means is that over the past several years, we've dealt with communicable diseases, diseases that are caught by breathing, by sneezing, by touching and inhalation and infectious diseases. Those are what we call communicable diseases. They're passed along by just being in close proximity. Uh, but non-communicable diseases are, are lifestyle-mediated diseases. They're diseases that exist because of community burden and it, uh, diseases that exist 
because of foods that we eat and habits that we've we've uh, uh, gained over the, the preceding years, and it leads to high rates of death and to disability. So here's a staggering stat, is that every year, 41 million people die from non-communicable diseases. But here's the thing, 85% of the people, of these people who die, they live in low-income and middle-income countries. Low income and middle income countries is what we see on the global level. And now this is true to me as a cardiologist is that it's predicted, and this is only now what, seven, uh, eight years away, seven and a half years away, that cardiovascular disease will be the main cause of death everywhere, but all diseases will be disproportionately high in poorer countries. Now here's the, the issue is we know that the vast majority of people of African descent have high blood pressure, which is a cardiovascular disease that leads to thickening of the heart muscle that then leads to heart failure. We know that, that the percentage of individuals that I know, I just launched from my nonprofit, Healthy Heart Nation, a blood pressure initiative where we're placing blood pressure machines in barbershops. The studies have validated this for many, many years. So it's time, we're beyond the time of saying, can this be impactful to showing that it is impactful. So we're committed to putting blood pressure machines in barbershops, beauty salons, and churches for it to be checked. And so in this midst, over 30 to 40% of individuals who were screened within the first month had stage two hypertension. Hypertension is pervasive. It's pervasive and we're seeing on a regular basis. Also, what we know is that this main burden of infectious disease, it falls really on these low and middle income countries. Uh, as many countries increase in wealth, they continue to face the infectious disease, but with the change in lifestyle, right? Because now they, they, they want to aspire to be like Americans. Uh, to eat the standard American diet, to eat the, the food that many of our forefathers helped craft in terms of, of soul food that's become a delicacy and which often accompanies wealth. They add to that an epidemic of stroke, high blood pressure and heart disease. And I would, I would argue that, that what this does too as well is it increases the likelihood uh, that you will succumb to infectious diseases. And this is what was borne out during the COVID pandemic is that we saw distinctly that those who had a poor lifestyle were more inclined to succumb to COVID-19. We saw that distinctly in multiple studies that were, were done there. There's another kind of a double entendre, a double burden, so to speak, in that we're facing is that 795 million people on the earth are hungry, uh, that, they're, that they're living in conditions in which they're, they have food insecurities. But at the same point, we have 1.9 billion people who are overweight or, or obese because they're eating foods that are highly caloric and poor from a nutritional value, right? Or either they're devoid of foods whatsoever. And we're thinking many times the solution is to give them the foods that we, 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 we eat so readily inside communities of, uh, at risk, inside of uh, these, these what's now characterized as social determinants of health, the areas in which people live work, play, and breathe inside of the United States, these areas are the same areas that breed food uh, insecurities. Uh, now, what, what others, they call this a global syndemic, a new term that has been coined. It was mentioned here in the Lancet Journal, an international well-recognized journal. A global syndemic, this is a combined catastrophic impact of obesity and undernutrition combined with the climate change. So this is what we were just talking about, but now the systems that are in place that are producing the foods that are leading to obesity and undernutrition, they're overfed and undernourished. It's also leading to the climate change, which means that we are not taking care of the earth, that we're not tilling. The Bible speaks all throughout in terms of uh, every seven years of rest and so forth with the ground and certain things are in place to take care of the earth and we're not doing this. This was one of the first tasks uh, those created of Adam and Eve was to tend to the garden, and we're not tending to this garden called Earth. And it's leading to this thing called climate change is what we're, we're seeing. And so the United Nations, this collaboration of nations, as we all know, Standing Committee on Nutrition Statement, it said that it is critical to promote changes in dietary patterns towards less greenhouse gas intensive, healthier, more plant-based diets, containing more fruits, more whole grains and pulses. Pulses, this, this, this brings to recognition, right? Uh, that, 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 that first experiment that was done, maybe we quote research all the time. Dr. Stoll does a wonderful job presenting to, to physicians all abroad. And what's one of the first recognized research 
Uh, it wasn't inside the, the Lancet Journal, New England Journal. It was inside the Bible where Daniel went ahead and he did a, an observational experiment that was there. <laughs> it was a non-blinded, randomized experiment where he pit himself and his friends versus others in where they eat pulses. Uh, and at the end of that time, they were healthier. They looked more pretty. They were pretty men, right? <laughs> and, and, and they were stronger and they, they went on to perform exceptionally well. And so we know that this is something that not only impacts your appearance inside this shallow society, I must say, it also impacts what we call the top, the leading causes of death. And when we look at these top leading causes of death, uh, they're all intimately related to our nutrition, to our lifestyle, ischemic heart disease, which is what I treat. That goes to, to strokes, to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is a disease of the lungs, which lends itself to smoking and living inside of disparate communities that are near uh, refineries, uh, coal mining, areas of that nature that lead to lung disease. The respiratory infections, which we're all uh, uh, aware of, that we know that there's a, a black maternal health issue in which we're, we're worse than many third world countries here in the United States, but this is looking at it globally in terms of our maternal health outcomes. Uh, we look at issues regarding cancer to as well, Alzheimer's disease, which many are characterizing as type three diabetes, the impact of nutrition in small vascular strokes, uh, diarrhea or, or gastrointestinal disease, diabetes, as I mentioned to you with my own father and kidney disease, which I mentioned with my father-in-law. Top leading causes of death, they're all intimately related to this thing called social determinants of health, as well as to uh, nutrition. So one of the things that we're seeing is this, once again, this globalization, uh, marketing of unhealthy products, it's opened wide the entry point for the rise of lifestyle-related chronic diseases. We're seeing this in our kids. We're seeing advertisement that now this is trickling out into other countries that are aspiring to be like America. That as demographics shift and people are able to afford higher calorie uh, convenience foods, there's a, a concomitant, there is a, 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 a unilateral rise, a simultaneous rise in the obesity and malnutrition epidemic that undernourished and overfed is what happens as a result. Uh, but it's complicated. We see that this hectic lifestyle of consumers. And so I, I had the opportunity, uh, thanks to, to Dr. Stoll, to, to travel to Saudi Arabia and to present there internationally as I dove into the data looking there and, and looking at that they suffer with many of the same ill effects that we do, that this rise in consumption of fast food products because of the marketing, because of the advertisement, because of the convenience, because of the, the desire to live like Americans, uh, it's led to this acceptance of, of fast food, but it's also led to disease burden on a regular basis. So what is the answer? What can we do to change the narrative behind this? Well, we have to, it goes even beyond. So lifestyle medicine is important. And I love what Dr. Mitchin said at the beginning is that we have to work together. That means you with me. That means I am you. I'm also a, a, a church member. I'm also a, a community member and I, being a physician as well. So we work together because it's important to, to, to tackle four pillars, access to care. Our people are receiving access to care. This is on a global level. Do they have the ability? We spoke about this in disparities and costs. Service, are they receiving ideal service? Caring service, one that's looking at their circumstances, not just the disease, looking at them as individuals. Is there high quality care? Is the care affordable? Are there basic fundamental things that we're able to do? And, and where can lifestyle impact all of these areas that are there to improve? that we have to look at things from a total population standpoint, that we're more than just an individual. We are impacted by our circumstances, the social determinants of health, once again, our education. This is on a global level, our housing, the food, our jobs, our, our, uh, the employment, the environment, they all play a role in our overall health, in prevention, in protection, uh, in promotion of health. What kind of healthcare services, what's our mental health like? All these things improving the equity, the advance it because we know that quality health care is equitable health care. And that means that all people, right, irrespective of their gender, their race or ethnicity, where they live, whether or not I live in, 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 in Cabo San Lucas or if I live in Jamaica or if I live in, in West Africa, that I am entitled to receive care 
that's timely, that's centered towards me as a person, that has that safe, that integrates my belief systems in it too as well. That becomes important because when we do this and we can improve our access to care, it's very simply, we can save 60 million lives by 2030. Right? This is this is the thing that by simply providing basic fundamental uh, access to care, uh, the one analogy that was given back, I can't even take credit for it. It was a, a classmate in med school, but I never forgot it. He said, everyone should be able to, to ride a bus to receive transportation. It doesn't mean everyone's going to get a Rolls Royce, but she, you should receive some basic fundamental aspects of things. And now what that means is, is that should we get preventive uh, care? Absolutely. Should we end this the idea of food security and food insecurity? Yes, we should. Now, food insecurity also means the overabundance of, of refined foods and, and the less abundance of whole foods, real foods, plant-rich foods, foods that can nourish our body on a regular basis. And so these are the things that become important, but it's complicated. Uh, this excerpt that's here from, from a journal, it talks about yeah, as complicated as, as this slide is, is as complicated as it gets as it relates to the relationship between providing agriculture the, the political aspect of it, the political determinants of health mixed with the social determinants of health, the legislation, as we recently saw legislation, legislative changes, the same thing happens with our agriculture that can impact our health and our outcomes. And so we have to stay vigilant. We have to stay aware. We have to push our representatives who represent us for the importance of health in our communities and on a global stage too as well. What's the answer? Lifestyle medicine. Uh, and lifestyle medicine and the works of, of Dr. Scott Stoll, he can speak to this more uh, effectively than I can, reaching abroad, reaching outside of who we are, because that's what our mission is to go throughout all the world and make disciples. And to make disciples, we have to follow in, the, in step with Christ. And that first is to heal, provide healing. We have to provide uh, uh, relief from the pain and suffering, the mental pain and suffering, the physical pain and suffering that exists. And that's one of the powers of lifestyle medicine. I just wanted to share those brief slides with you and kind of go through some things, but that's the power, that's the importance. And that's why what you all are doing here today in conveying this information is so powerful and it has the potential to impact more people than you know. But I'll stop there and allow uh, any questions. If not, we'll transition to Dr. Stoll, Stoll and then we'll follow up with uh, questions later on. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we are gonna transition uh, to Dr. Stoll and we'll come back with a, just a couple of questions for each one of you. Thank you so very much. At this time, I present Dr. Scott Stoll. Thank you so much, Natalie. And hello there, Columbus, everybody. So good to see you. I'm actually here, it's dark. I'm in the United Arab Emirates, Abu Dhabi, doing some work on this side of the world that God has opened up. And as Columbus said, you know, we are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Jesus said, go forth into all the world and preach the gospel. And so as these opportunities open up for us around the world, we go and we lead with whatever God takes us with and where, wherever we go, we share the gospel. And today I have the privilege of talking about uh, the practical aspect on the backside of what Columbus was just sharing, which is the incredible importance of teaching lifestyle medicine and healthcare around the world. It's the only solution that we have for our population, especially those developing countries um, where they can, they can begin to utilize solutions from the ground up, the ground under their feet to solve their healthcare problems rather than looking for technology to be a solution. And as Columbus mentioned, it's lifestyle medicine. That, that is the solution, that's the only solution. And it actually goes back to the Garden of Eden because uh, that's what God created when he created Adam and Eve. It was, it was lifestyle. It was perfect relationship with the Father, the Creator. It was perfect relationship one with another. It was perfect relationship with the world it was a perfect understanding of how to steward the world and to recreate the beauty of the garden all over the world. It was a perfect relationship with nature and the environment. It was a perfect relationship with food. And so part of our call is actually to go forth and reproduce the garden. And part of that reproduction is actually going back to the garden and eating what God created there in Genesis 129. He created plants, 
He created trees with fruit. He created pulses, as Columbus said. He created whole grains. And as we build our diet based upon the food the Creator gave us, it's no surprise that our bodies spring to life. And it is a wonderful thing to see a body spring to life. Just a couple of slides. Um, again, just to set up the idea of uh, culinary medicine, it's really important for us to, to, uh, to understand, and it's a biblical principle that we harvest from the seeds that we plant. And sometimes we're given seeds to plant by our relatives, by our culture. We're given a bag of seeds and we start planting seeds because that's what everybody else is doing around us. And we get this, this harvest of weeds. And uh, we see the weeds and we wonder what happened? Why do I have heart disease, type two diabetes? Why did I develop dementia? Why is there cancer in my family? We have to go back and look at the seeds that we've been planting. It's a spiritual principle in every part of our lives. If we don't like the harvest, we have to go back and look at the seed. And we have, most of us, been given by our culture the seeds of lifestyle diseases, non-communicable diseases, as Columbus was saying. And we've been planting, and now we have this epidemic harvest, unhealthy harvest of non-communicable diseases globally. But the good news is, that just like the ground, we can clear off the old harvest, you can plant new seeds, and in, an, in a quick season, you can begin to harvest a beautiful harvest of vibrant life by planting the right seeds. It actually is never too late to reap benefit from planting the right seeds. In our culture, because of the unhealthy seeds, we have harvested lifestyle diseases, as, as Columbus mentioned, you know, and it comes from the seeds of lack of exercise, toxic thoughts, nutrition, uh, nutrient def deficiencies, poor digestion, stress, inflammation, all of those things that you see as the, the roots of the fruit of the tree that we're looking at above came from the, the unhealthy seeds of lifestyle. But the good news is there is a way to reverse this. There's a way to turn it around. One of the important concepts that I want you to remember today is that um, food is never neutral. Food is never neutral. Your body is never not looking. So when you put something in your mouth, it has an immediate impact on your body within two to four hours. And that food is either bringing healing, reducing inflammation, restoring strength, regenerating cells, reducing inflammation in your brain, improving your mood, improving your memory, giving you energy, vitality, and strength to go forth and to be all that you were created to be, or that food within two to four hours is causing inflammation in your brain, in your heart, in your liver, in your joints, two to four hours. In fact, there was an interesting study where they gave people the um, inflammatory components of food and they followed their inflammatory levels and within two hours they had a spike of inflammation. Well, we kind of know that that's true, but what's really interesting, they followed depression scales and they followed scales of social isolation. And they found that as the inflammation went up, so too did their depression and also their so so social isolation. And so if we begin to think about the implications of this, that by eating the wrong foods, it's impacting our mood and it's causing us to be socially isolated. And we don't have to think too far to wonder if the enemy is not using food to affect our mood and isolate us from our call. I think so. But the power of the right food is not only reducing inflammation, but reversing disease. And these are just two examples, pictorial examples. A picture is worth a thousand words. On the left here, we see a brain with multiple sclerosis. Within this red circle, you see this white lesion. That is an area of inflammation in the brain. And in multiple sclerosis, that site of inflammation can cause weakness in the legs, tingling, numbness, difficulty speaking. Six months later, we see the same MRI. The lesion is completely gone, and so too were the symptoms in my friend. And so my friend's life was completely changed in six months by simply 
reversing her lifestyle, planting new seeds. Six months later, her symptoms are gone, and so also is the lesion in her brain. On the right here, we also see um, these are arteries from the heart. This would be Columbus's amazing work, where he would thread a catheter into this artery in A and open it up with a stent. But this was actually a cardiologist uh, who had a heart attack, um, did not want a stent, and instead changed his diet. And 18 months later, in B, we see that the artery has been restored. Now, this doesn't happen all the time, and sometimes there is surgery required. But in many cases, if it's not critical, these diseases are reversible. And reversal also applies to type 2 diabetes, to lupus. Uh, prevention and early reversal can apply to dementia like Alzheimer's, but if we, that goes too long, that one may not be reversible. Uh, but the, the goal here is, yes, we can reverse disease, but the real goal is prevention and optimization. So we have to realize that our goal is not just disease reversal, not to get a disease and have to reverse it with diet and lifestyle. That's a wonderful opportunity that God's given us, that our bodies can spring to life again when we plant new seeds. But the real goal is to be vibrantly alive every day, to wake up and feel great, to wake up and have clarity of your mind, to have energy, to not have pain, to be able to step out of bed and say, all right, Jesus, I am ready to go and be your hands and feet. There's only one body. Christ is the head. We are the arms, the legs, the feet, the wrist, the fingers. All of us have a different call. We are the body of Christ. And so the real goal for us is to be vibrantly alive, strong, with mental clarity so that we can accept the assignments that God has, us, has for us that day. And we can step out boldly and go into that call unhindered, by disease, unhindered by depressed mood from neuroinflammation in the brain, unhindered by pain in our joints that limit us from even taking missions trips, unhindered by anything that uh, our physical body may declare is a limit. God wants a whole and healed body of Christ that we can all go forth. And so I just want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the vibrantly alive as we talk about the disease reversal because it's both. And the goal is to be vibrantly alive. So how do we get there? As Columbus said, we get there through a whole food plant-based diet and lifestyle. Um, I'm focusing on the plant-based diet with culinary medicine today, but I don't want to ignore the importance as Natalie, Reverend Natalie said, of um, the lifestyle components. But the diet is critically important for health. And it <clears throat> is comprised of everything that God planted on the earth back in Genesis. All these vibrant foods that within two to four hours of eating them are going all the way down to your DNA to change your future. But changing to a whole food plant-based diet in today's society is difficult. For most of human history, people cooked food over fires, over stoves, even in the early 1900s up to the 1940s and early 50s, we cooked food at home. But in the last 70 years, we've had this massive transformation of our food system, shifting into ultra processed food, fast food, and most Americans and people around the world have lost many of their cooking skills. And so we have a lot of barriers to making these transitions to a healthy diet, including the basic cooking skills. So I worked with people that don't even know how to make, uh, how to steam broccoli or make a bowl of oatmeal. So we've just lost cooking skills uh, because of our culture. Uh, the knowledge of how to cook or how to get around a kitchen, what kind of appliances to buy, how to use a knife, the confidence to go into a kitchen. Um, you can imagine if you don't have the knowledge or skills, it can be a daunting, uh, a daunting project to think about making dinner six or seven nights a week. The awareness of the types of foods and where to shop and how to, co how to cook and uh, use spices. Access to foods, as Columbus was saying, is critically important. And we have so many areas in our country and around the world where there is limited access to food, which creates tremendous health disparities. 
but learning how to overcome some of those access points by going under, over, around, and through, and helping those communities um, not only have access within the community, but find the, the access outside of the community. And overcoming the challenge of commercialized meals. We can throw it in the microwave or the oven, oven for 30 minutes and end up with food that's not very healthy, or you can actually run through the drive through and have a commercialized meal. It's interesting in the studies that they've looked at, um, the time it takes to go through a drive through versus going home and cooking, and it's actually about the same time. You really save no time going through the drive through versus cooking at home. And you may not save any money, and you certainly are losing on the health end. So the, the, the myth of the fast food lane uh, is really a myth. It is not any faster. You're not really saving any money, and you're losing in the health in the long term. So one of the ways to overcome these barriers to change is with the uh, AME's Culinary RX. So this is a prescription with only positive side effects. This is an opportunity to kind of reclaim your kitchen, to revitalize your cooking skills, to pick up a knife and a pot and a pan again and learn how to cook delicious food at home that saves you money, saves you time, and maximizes the health of your body. So in combination, uh, in uh, partnership with the um, AME, uh, the Plantrition Project, our not-for-profit, and Ruby Cooking School, uh, put together a 12-hour online course uh, called the Culinary Rx. This is an amazing instructional opportunity that includes online education about plant-based nutrition, many of the basics, how to shop, how to prepare a shopping list, how to combine foods, how to use spices, how to make food really delicious, along with the skills that you need in order to um, begin taking back your kitchen and making really delicious meals. The Culinary Rx is uh, taught by leading chef educators, med medical professionals, um, members from the AME Church. And the goal here is to really empower individuals um, within the body of Christ to reclaim their kitchen, to take back their health, begin cooking for themselves, begin training other people with their skills, uh, cooking healthy meals for people that are in need in the church, inviting people over and using the kitchen as a unique opportunity to reach the community, to not only transform your health and your family's health, but to introduce other people to the delicious um, culinary delights that can come out of a uh, superhero kitchen. Within the Culinary Arts, there are 70 recipes, 95 instructional videos. Um, it's self-paced and you get a certification upon completion. And it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity that AME is providing for you to uh, reclaim your kitchen. Here's just a, a picture of the um, the course description and how it looks on the inside. We have kind of orientation. You have short little videos that you watch that are really entertaining and done exceptionally well. Um, and then there are small quizzes at the end that are very simple, but just to help cement that information. Uh, there's also an opportunity for you to, you know, pick up a knife and begin working in your kitchen and learn how to handle a knife, buy a knife, um, learn how to cook in, a, in, in your oven and on your stove. So it's really just, it's a beautiful, simple, elegant course um, that uh, you have this opportunity to uh, engage in. And here's just an example of the video just showing you how to use a knife. Um, and you know, but actually I have to admit, before we started this course, this was back in 2012, I thought I knew how to use a knife, but I didn't really know how to use a knife safely. And because of the Colony RX, I learned how to use a knife safely and taught my children, and now all my children know how to use a knife safely. So, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's a great course for all of us to pick up new skills in our kitchen. And here's some pictures of the incredible food that you'll have the opportunity to make in this course. Absolutely delicious meals. There's a real myth going around, this is a myth buster, that healthy food tastes terrible. I hear it all the time when people find out that I'm a doctor that talks about nutrition. The first th thing they say to me, they say, Dr. Stoll, I don't like to eat twigs, sticks, and leaves. And I say, I don't like to eat those things either. I like to eat food that looks like this, that's a beautiful, absolutely delicious food. And I find oftentimes that 
we have people over to our home and they eat our food and they say, I didn't know that healthy food could be this good. This is so much better than the food that I eat at home. And so I hope through the course that you'll discover how delicious healthy food can actually be. Here are a few more pictures of these incredible nourishing meals. These are the actual meals that you will learn how to cook in this course. Um, and they are fantastic meals. They have been tried, tested, and uh, they will be spot on uh, for your kitchen. And so the goal here is really to end up becoming a superhero in your kitchen. You know, to be a superhero that um, is taking care of your family, empowering your family with health, empowering your community with health. I've known a number of people that have gone through the Culinary Rx. They have found a gifting in cooking and they have begun uh, to offer culinary classes in their home, taking the information and teaching other people within their homes. So this is a tremendous opportunity for all of you to become superheroes in your kitchen. And really one of the things I just want to end with is that, you know, and I, I like to show pictures of children because we are stewarding the earth, we're stewarding our families, we're stewarding our own bodies for the next generation. Our culture has really been drawn into this consumer mindset where everything becomes about us. But as we see from the Bible, God encourages us that we are really to love our neighbor as ourself. In the same way God loved us when we were still sinners and sent Jesus to be the intermediary for us, we have to have the same love for people, the same love for our families, the same love for our communities, that we would go as stewards of a great message, of a great mission, and give of ourselves to bring transformation and change for our communities, our families, and this next generation that has the opportunity to step into an incredible opportunity to represent the king of the universe, healthy, strong, vibrantly alive, and taking the gospel out into the world. So thank you. I'll turn this back over to, Nat over to Natalie for um, the Q&A. Fantastic. Thank Amen. you so much for the wonderful Amen. information information that you're sharing. There's someone in the background saying, amen, amen. So we just have a couple of questions. Can each one of you share with us um, a lifestyle medicine success story of one of your clients? Yeah, Columbus, go ahead. You know, I think probably the the one that's most impactful was the one where I, I didn't directly even uh, connect with the person. So they attended one of my uh, cooking classes and lectures. And they went on to adopt many of the the habits that we discussed during that time, and they were they were just um, they they made su substantial changes. I mean, they went on and they they ended up losing it was I believe it was a forty pounds over about a four month period of time. And the weight is not the key, but the key was that they were concerned about their diabetes. They were concerned about their ability as they approached retirement age of living a a, a healthful journey and extending their health span. And so they were um, so thankful for it. And so this person was worked at a Canadian country uh, company outside of the the uh, the area here, and was so grateful that all he's done continually is tell everyone, "Doc, Doc saved my life." And I said, "I didn't save your life. <laughs> I, I don't like to take the credit. And I don't like taking the blame. But what I can tell you is that you know you were empowered." And I was there at the right moment to just plant the seed that then was watered and I'm I'm grateful for it. And so we now each one go on to, to teach one. And so that's probably the most powerful one that I have of recent memory here. Fantastic, thank you. And Dr. Scott? Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna share one like Columbus because I think it highlights again that if you wanna make a change, you can make a change, you'll find the resources. Um, and that there's so much hope so I was a part of a conference in Midland, Texas, and uh, we had a, a gentleman that came to the conference. He was in his late 30s. He had multiple sclerosis, was using a walker, was on disability, and was incontinent, uh, incontinent of bowel and bladder. He was wearing diapers at 38 years old. Um, and, you know, as I learned later, depressed because he couldn't play with his children. So he attended our conference, he listened to the information, and he just went home and made a change. He just started eating plant-based nutrition. 
He couldn't exercise. You know, he, he wasn't able to do any fitness. He just simply changed his diet. In one month, he was caught in a bowel and bladder, got rid of his diapers. In three months, he got rid of his walker. Five months later, he got a job and was playing ball with his children in the backyard. And I think, you know, that's just such an inspiring story because it's a life that's truly changed. You know, 38 year old man, now he's working, engaged with his family, playing ball with his children. And I didn't have anything to do with it, but just to be at a conference. And it just shows us that, you know, when you're inspired, you'll find the resources and you'll do anything. And so part of this journey is um, helping people to get inspired to know that there is hope. Thank you so much. And so Dr. Scott, what you're mentioning, the conference, how many countries and approximately how many doctors attend your international plant-based conference? And why do you yeah, think we've they been, We've been very bled, uh, blessed, Natalie. We've had um, on average about 1,200 uh, healthcare providers from between 28 and 40 countries, depending on the year that have attended our conferences, you know, from all over the world. And so now we're having opportunities that, you know, like Columbus and I were in Saudi Arabia this year and UAE and Taiwan and all over, uh, you know, it's that God's opening up these, these opportunities to take this message around the world. Fantastic. And Dr. Baptiste, as a heart doctor, do you think lifestyle medicine is essential to reduce heart disease, cancer, and other diseases worldwide? I know you're presentative, but maybe you could just articulate again. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think it's less about what I think and more about what the research says. And there's just such overwhelming research that really supports all the pillars that you've all you've outlined in terms of just the power of mindfulness, of, of prayer and of meditation, the power of movement, of exercise, not of simple gardening, of walking, of doing things of that nature, the power of love of forgiveness and gratitude, the power of food, real food, as Dr. Stoll just mentioned, the power of relationships of intimacy, the power of sleep for transformation of rest, the day of rest, of coming at ease, whether it's vacationing and full day of rest, that's there, the power of laughter, that all these things play a role, not only on your heart health, which extends throughout the entire body, but also your cancer and other areas that are there empowering you to live a life of service. And so absolutely, there's huge power by, by taking on those tenants. Okay, my last question for both of you, you know, lifestyle medicine is such a new term and then this plant-based nutrition, yes, we hear a lot. How do you think we continue to reach people, uh, your colleagues, but also just the community at large? Go ahead, Columbus, I'll follow you. Well, I'll start with I'll start with the community at large uh, um, there, and I think I think what we have to do is I think that we have to respect people is the way in which we reach people. We respect their culture, we respect where they're at, their circumstances, that we see them, that we hear them, and in the process of doing that, now we're able to tap in and let them know you don't have to give up your culture, you don't have to give up who you are in order to eat healthfully, because at the basic tenets of all of this, of every culture around the world, it's steeped in plant-rich foods. And so letting folks recognize that, yes, by going back to your base culture, that yes, you can achieve the health that you desire that can allow you to live a life of purpose. Yeah, that's great, my brother, I agree. And I, I was gonna say the same thing that I always encourage people, whether it's your family, your colleagues, your community, you always lead with, lead with love and respect. Um, and this is a message of hope, you know, often in the nutrition area, it's, it's easy to fall into the message of the evil of food, the bad foods and what happens and, you know, corporate greed and, um, you know, all of the bad stuff. But really, this is an incredible message of hope. And so I think if we take the message out and package it with the hope that it brings for a vibrant life today um, and disease reversal, and we begin leading with love and coming alongside people with the support and especially the community they need. The longer I do this, the more I realize this is all about community. Education is important, information is important, 
this is really about developing healthy communities where people can find you know support encouragement love accountability assistance guidance um, so we really need to build communities and Natalie you all have done that so well within the AME and that's why uh, it's I love being a part of this every year and uh, I applaud the work that you're doing Thank you so much. And we like to say that lifestyle medicine is accessible and affordable. And we're so happy that each one of you joined us as a part of our 30 year celebration of service. And we're excited that God has called all of us to this. And I, I think that many of who are watching and we're on Facebook Live see that you both are uh, uh, um, uh, brothers and, uh, and Christ. You, uh, In other words, you're faith based also. So isn't that nice to have a doctor and medical professions who also pray with you and share with you um, in your walk. So again, we're so excited that you're here with us today. Now, one of the things we're going to ask you to do, um, if you're able to stay, um, great. We hope you're able to. As people are putting questions in the chat, just because there's so many people on, and certainly there are people on Facebook, if you would uh, search the chat and you can answer some questions in the chat, that would be great. Also of each one of you, Dr. Baptiste and Dr. Stoll, put your contact information um, in website, however you like to share that in the chat, that would be great. We, we appreciate you doing that. So with that too, you know, Dr. Um, Stoll shared with everyone the fact that we have culinary RX as I go back to my slide. And we want to invite you uh, certainly to um, enroll in um, culinary RX AME. So that's very important that um, I highlight the fact that it's Culinary Rx AME. So I wanted to put up for you again um, on the screen um, how you can access Culinary Rx AME. And so you want to make sure that you go to www.ame-church.ruby.com. And as was mentioned, as Dr. Stoll said, this is a partnership with Ruby, the world's largest online school. And we are so grateful to them because actually we began this partnership in about 2018. And, and isn't it wonderful how God gave this vision before we got to a place where the world was talking about plant-based nutrition and the world was talking about lifestyle medicine. Here we are with Dr. Scott Stoll, the Plant Nutrition Project and Ruby already talking about this project along with uh, Dr. Burnett seeing this vision as we were moving forward. And so before you, there you have, again, our poster, which we're going to be sharing widely. And th there is a one-time fee. You know I'm a preacher. Everybody say one time. There's a one-time fee of $49.99, but that gives you lifetime access to Culinary Rx AME, because there's two Culinary Rx. But I want to, want to make sure we highlight the fact, as you were shown um, some uh, information or content from Culinary Rx, that there are scriptures built in. So you're going to have scriptures in Culinary Rx AME. And you saw that there are health and nutrition videos, hands-on cooking videos. And we have recently added a plant-based soul food re recipes called um, Reimagining uh, Sunday Favorites Reimagine. And they're created by my friend, and she's spoken at many of our events, Donna Green Goodman. So you've got a, a sweet potato pie recipe in it that's plant-based. That means there's no cow's milk and no eggs in it. So you can learn how to make it from plant-based way. And um, there's also a um, collard green recipe. So we encourage you to check it out. So I wanted you to capture that, write that down um, so that you'll make sure that you're logging on to the right spot. But again, there's a one time, everybody say one time, one time <laughs> uh, cost of $49.99, but it's gonna give you lifetime access um, to this program. Wanted to also let you know, you hear us talking about a lot about plant-based nutrition, and I think it's very important as someone who's also studied plant-based nutrition and got my certification in it. Here's the thing. I'm also a registered dietitian nutritionist, and I understand, as Dr. Columbus said, that we have to respect how everybody eats. So our goal is not to force anybody to become plant-based, meaning only eat foods from the ground. Our goal is not to force anybody to become vegan or vegetarian. We want you to understand the benefits of eating more of a whole plant-based meals, all of your meals colorful. So what you see on the screen real quickly is that research over time is continuing to support what we've been teaching for years and years. As you see the healthy eating plate there from the Harvard University, that that plate is mostly plant-based. And so we wanted you to see that. And then you also see the diabetes plate from the American Diabetes Association. You'll also notice everybody that that plate is mostly plant-based. So these are two examples 
that support. And when, you go, when you're when you going through the journey of culinary Rx, know this, that it supports evidence-based research, research that indicates that meals that are mostly plant-based help to fight and prevent disease. So we wanted you to see that visually because I agree with Dr. Scott, a picture is worth a, a thousand words. And that's why we like to have the PowerPoints so that you can see as you take this journey, um, as you make selections on um, eating. So moving forward to, again, we said to you, because we are recognizing 30 years of service, we want to invite you to take a 30 day culinary AME, RX and lifestyle challenge with us. On the screen there, you'll see a link to a survey monkey. If you write that down, take a picture, capture it any way that you can, we're inviting you to go to this survey monkey and it will open up and you'll see that there'll be uh, those 11 options that you see that are the components of lifestyle medicine that you can choose to join or choose to do or participate in over the next 30 days. And you can start your 30 days anytime you're ready to start your 30 days. Why the survey monkey? Because we wanna capture how many people take the journey with us. So again, I want you to take a picture or write down um, the, this link to the survey monkey. You'll read through it. Um, you'll provide information about yourself, but know that any information you provide to yourself, as it says in the survey monkey, will only be viewed by the medical director, Dr. Mary Burnett, or I. Um, so no one will get your personal name, but it'll allow us to collect the information of how your journey went. So again, the components of lifestyle medicine are there before you. I read it on the screen earlier, so I won't repeat it again. But these are the things, these 11 items are what is built into this survey that you can choose the one. You don't have to choose all of them, but you can choose the ones that you would like to participate in and including um, uh, participating and enrolling in Culinary Rx if you choose to enroll in that. So we wanted to invite you to take this 30-day Culinary AME or AME, Culinary Rx AME, I always say it interchangeably uh, and lifestyle cha challenge with us. And we hope many of you will do so. Now at this time, it's time to get up and stretch and move. Remember I told you we were gonna have an activity where you get up because it's not good to sit. Correct, Dr. Scott and Dr. Columbus? We shouldn't be sitting all the time, right? You want to, I know I was watching something where Dr. Uh, Scott had, he. I think you were in Saudi Arabia and did you have everybody standing on one foot? What was it? They were balancing, I can't remember what it was. But they That's were making right. sure, yes, okay. And they were making sure they were engaging all those muscles in their core. Um, so we want you now. So this is what we want you to do for our five minute, and I'll tell you when to go, okay? So what you're gonna do, you're gonna stand up, you're gonna go to your kitchen, and in five minutes, I want you to bring back to where you're at one box of a food item that has less than 20% sodium, one can item that has less than 20% sodium one frozen food item that has less than 20% sodium, one fresh fruit of any kind, one fresh vegetable of any kind. If you don't have all of them, bring back what you found. Well, we want you to get up and we want you to move. Are you ready? Set, go. All right, everybody, we, we're hoping everybody's getting up and going, going and get what you can find. Okay, we're all going. This is your five minute break. We want you to go and find those items. Again, one box of a food item that's less than 20% sodium, one can of a food item with less than 20% sodium, one frozen food item with less than 20% sodium, and one fresh food of any kind or a fresh vegetable of any kind. Now, for some of you, maybe you, you are at a location, you can't go and find an item, um, then what you can do is why don't you just move around, you know, move your legs, lift them up and down, move your arms. We hope, we're hoping everybody's participating, but just in case you can't, um, again, why don't you cross your arms in front of you, reach up over your head, whatever you need to do, twist to the side and twist to the other side. And I'm watching um, the five minute here on my, um, my clock on the wall. So we want you to stretch and move around, walk from one room to the other if you need to. Just continue to move around. You can march in place. If you're seated, you can still lift your legs up and down. Some of you, why don't you join me in marching in place? It's good to be able to do that. It's good to be able to find, you know, some uh, physical activity that you're able to do, you know, and if you can't do it very long, then of course, stop. You can always stop, take a break, take a break. 
and you can start walking again. Let's try this. Some of you with me who might still be there, why don't you breathe in through your nose, breathe out through your mouth. Again, join me again, breathe in, hold it and breathe out through your mouth. Breathe in, hold it, breathe out through your mouth. Just calming the body, just relaxing the body. Okay, so again, let's try some, let's try just moving our head from side to side, not fast, but slowly. Just look to your left, which is probably opposite of me on the screen, and then slowly go to your right. Then come back to the middle. Again, go to your left, and all the way to the right, and then slowly back to the middle. Now, how about let's circle all the way around to your right. Again, nice and slow, not too fast. At the ability that you're able to do it. All the way around one more time. Going around to the right. Let's stop, look forward. And now let's circle around to the left. All the way around, stretching those neck muscles nice and slow. Really, I should have Dr. Scott doing this. He's the one who has the degree <laughs> in all of this. One more time around to the left. Very good. Now let's look up and look down and look up and look down and look up and look down and straight ahead again. Fantastic. All right, let's move again in place. Notice how you've got bunches of folk coming back in talking about they've got their food. I want to know, can food. I enter? Okay, <laughs> I know. You can't, Dr. Burnett. We can't enter. Okay, you've got your food. All right, everybody's coming back. Fantastic. You've got your food. All right, All right. about just another second here. Another second here. Okay. I'm also reading something as I stop marching. Doesn't have to be real hard. For the last couple of moves, just lift the, your left knee, then your right knee, whether standing or sitting, left knee or right knee. Okay, so fantastic. So you have your um, you have your you have your items in front of you. And so if you hold them up in the screen, you can just show, so we can just sort of be showing each other what we have found, okay? What's important about the Nutrition Facts label is we have learned from both of our lifestyle expert doctors that we need to understand what we're eating. Uh, we don't wanna have mindless eating. And so it's important that even with the food that you bring home, that again, you know what's in it. And so there's Nutrition Facts labeling on there. And the thing that we're gonna focus on today, there's a lot of important information, but today, as especially a part of our Cleveland, Ohio um, nutrition facts labeling um, program that we're doing and menu disclosure. And also for all of you as a part of our town hall, we're just gonna focus on the sodium. So again, hopefully you've read the back of that item that you have and what you want to make sure is when you're buying foods um, that are in boxes and cans and frozen because we realize that's a part of our reality that you wanna make sure that they are 20, less than 20% in sodium. That is a healthy guide for you. And you see that also on the screen. So that's why we wanted you to go and grab that. And if you had trouble finding it, we'll I'll let you know that now you've learned um, uh, through this education. So the next time you go shopping, you wanna make sure that you look for food items that are less than 20% in sodium. And then fresh fruits and vegetables, we need to have plenty of those around. And they are in most cases naturally low in sodium. So you wanna eat plenty of fresh fruits and vegetables. You know, certainly you can cook your uh, vegetables, but you wanna start out with whole plant-based foods. Why? Because as we learn, those plant the seeds to moving to good health. Now, we wanna give away 10 of our Culinary Rx programs, that's 10. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to the, Dr. Scott Stoll, if you look in the participants, um, the participants list, and if you could call a name, and the person, as we did the last time when we met in January, if your name is called, uh, he's going to pick someone, you will be a winner of one of our Culinary R 
coronary, coronary rx ame um then we we need for you to send an email to heal commission at aol.com those of you who are assisting me if you put that um email in the chat that's heal commission at aol.com of uh, the name that is called and then you have to send me an email to say my name was called that's how we verify it so dr scott uh whose name would you like to call and Natalie, you've got uh, one on Facebook who has put in that uh, she has hers as well. Okay, so you're going to give me her name. If she can give it to you somehow. Thank you. Presiding Elder um, Florence McElroy. Thank from you so Jamaica. much. So, okay, so that's one. Okay, so number two? Uh, Carol Dawson. Okay, congratulations. Thank you so much. Dr. Baptiste, can you call out someone for number three? Lose him, he might not be there. We'll give him an opportunity to come back. Um, Delicia, can you call out someone for number three? Reverend Naomi Myers. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Burnett, can you call out another one for number four? Um, the next one down would be uh, are we going in order? Is that what we're doing, or just you have to know? You can go scroll through, maybe go someone to join a little bit later okay all right um let's go ew yuck <laughs> what happened eddie durer has mustard beets black eyed peas <laughs> apples and spaghetti <laughs> fantastic <laughs> say her name one more time betty durer d-u-r-r -R. Okay, congratulations, <laughs> congratulations. Bishop uh, Francine Brookers, I know she had to attend another meeting too. If she's on, could you call out someone for number six? She's not scheduled to come back for another five minutes. Okay, no problem. So going back to Dr. Scott, can you call out someone else for us? Nehemiah Miller. Fantastic, congratulations. Delicia, number seven. Beanie McKinnon. She's actually on the health commission, so we can't give it to her. <laughs> um, and I'm already signed up anyway. Thank you. <laughs> Joycey um, Skewler. Okay, congratulations. Let's see, did Dr. Columbus, was he able to join us again for number eight? Sounds like he unmutes, but we can't hear him. Okay. All right, going back to you, Dr. Burnett, who can be number eight? I think I'm having a problem with the leadership here is all over this thing. Um, uh, oops, let's see, I got the same problem again. How about Laura Neal? Okay, all right, congratulations. That was number eight. Uh, back to you, Dr. Scott for number nine. And Delisa, you're gonna do number 10, so you can start looking. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Sharon Drew. All right. Congratulations, number nine. And the tenth one we're giving away, Delicia Crater, drum roll, Clater, drum roll. <laughs> Linda Carmen Bryant. Uh, she's oh. another health commission person. <laughs> she can't win. <laughs> um, Reverend Ronald L. Sparks. Okay, wow, congratulations, fantastic. So those are our 10. So remember, you have to email me at heelcommission at aol.com to say I won. We also have this recorded, so we have the names and then we will give you instructions on how you can um, access your enrollment. Let us all congratulate them and thank you all for participating in our five minutes of fitness and our nutrition facts scavenger hunt, fantastic. Again, thank you so much uh, for this first half. And now what we're going to move into is that you, as I said, we are celebrating 30 years of service. Um, again, there's a, there's a survey monkey link in case you need to grab it again. Those of you, even though you didn't win, as you just heard, taking a culinary RX AME journey and a lifestyle medicine journey will be a blessing to your life. So I hope you'll join us 
and click on that survey monkey, fill out the information and take this journey with us. But now I'm gonna be turning this over to Reverend Dr. Miriam Burnett. She is our medical director, who's now gonna take us to the, sec to the second half of celebrating our 30 years. Thank you all. Thank you so very much. Um, it is my pleasure to be with, uh, with everyone. We have um, asked our, there are only three of us that have been around all the last 30 years. Um, I think it actually may be four, um, but three of the four of us are on now and we're going to ask in this order uh, exhorter Gwen Williams will come and give us uh, where we've come from. Uh, then presiding elder Rosetta Swinton, who was both the seventh Episcopal district director and now is the presiding elder uh, of one of our districts in the 20th Episcopal district in the country of Malawi, uh, registered nurse. Uh, and she's going to give us a perspective of, let's call it our global uh, footprint. And then I will return with why the health commission is so impactful as it relates to public health in our lives. We've heard some of that in the last um, few minutes, uh, but we will talk about some specifics about how we work and what we do in order to make that happen. Uh, and then we will be closed with a, 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 a charge from our chair, Bishop Francine Brookins. Gwen, I want you to know, because Gwen's been around since the beginning, um, when they first just allowed for Dr. Leonidas Berry to present first aid stations at a general conference. When finally retired at their 32 years of service and then was named the health director um, for the Southern California Conference. Gwen doesn't know how to sit down. <laughs> we, we've at least got her to stop traveling some. COVID helped us with that. But Gwen's uh, ability to teach us show us, demonstrate for us what it really means to empower others to work is just phenomenal. This is her life's work. She's a registered nurse, retired registered nurse, um, served and retired from uh, the army uh, in the uh, nurse corps. We just wanna thank her and applaud her for her leadership for all of the work that she did to bring us to this day. When I have a gift coming to your house, it should arrive Monday or Tuesday. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I didn't order it early enough for you to have it today. Um, but uh, I just wanna say thank you for I would not be here without you having met you in the floor of the general conference in 1992 doing CPR. Thank you for, as everybody likes to say, I um, voluntold, was voluntold to join the health commission. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and I want you all to know, this is where I learned it from exhorter Gwen Williams. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you. Good morning. I uh, wanna thank Miriam. Uh, she is a sister that loved I drafted Miriam in a bathroom. <laughs> if she remembers, we ended up having to take care of someone who had an incident in a bathroom. And Miriam has been with us ever since. Um, the Health Commission actually had been in effect by Dr. Berry as an ad hoc committee of the general conference. And it was, they, he utilized the American Red Cross to do the first aid. In 1980, 
Bishop Cummings, who was the presiding bishop for the eighth Episcopal District, and his wife, Supervisor Martha Cummings, asked me if I would set up a first aid station at the Hyatt Regency Hotel. At that time, I was the health director for Union Bethel AME Church in New Orleans. And so I agree. And the first thing that I discovered that we had to do was to equip it and then set up a protocol, which we did. And then we drew on the nurses from the New Orleans area to staff it. And we were there through, we were there for about 20 days because we went, came out of the Women's Missionary Society Quadranium and went into the General Conference. So it was kind of exhausting, but it was a challenge because I had never done that on that level. And I appreciate Dr. Bishop Cummings' confidence in me in putting me in that position. He said I could do it because I was an ex army nurse. And so I took it, I stepped out on faith and we set it up. Bishop Dr. Barry retired at that meeting. He, he said he had been there long enough and it was time to retire. And so he asked to retire as an honorary general officer and they allowed him to do so. In 1984, at the general conference in Kansas City, the position of executive director was created by the General Conference Health Commission. And Dr. Chiquita Five was uh, brought on board and she was asked to serve as the medical director because at that time it was basically just nurses on the commission. And we were told that we had to have a doctor on the commission in order to get funding. And so Dr. Fire stepped into that position. Um, things were kind of quiet. In 1988, we began to work on a handbook. And then in 1992, in Orlando, Florida, legislation was passed creating the Health Commission of the AME Church. And so it was then became a member of the general board. And that uh, general conference also identified Dr. Fai as the medical director and me as the executive director. And Bishop uh, Frederick Hilborn Talbot became the first com uh, chairman of the commission. And he helped us uh, in the years that followed. He helped us write our constitution and bylaws, which we operated under and which were um, revised by Dr. Burnett and, and Dr. Mitchum. So that's where we are at this point. That was my contribution. And it was a blessing. It was a wonderful journey. I learned a lot. I met a lot of wonderful people. We, in this time span between 88 and 92, we were able to develop local health commissioners, conference health commissioners, and district health commissioners. And some of them are still active in the various roles. Uh, I got drafted. I was minding my own business at an annual conference three years ago. And I heard my name being called, but I wasn't paying attention because it was it was during the pre-organizing. And I I was there as as my church's delegate, so I'm busy writing notes. 
and I hear my name. And so uh, at the break, I went to the presiding elder and I said, did I just hear my name hooked to something? And he said, yeah, we just made you the health director. And so that's how I got back into the saddle again. And also during that time, Dr. K. Brown, who was president of the lay organization, made me the health committee chairperson for the Connectional Lay Organization. And I held that position until uh, Dr. Willie Glover. Um, so I served that, in that position under seven different uh, lay presidents. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. You are funny, Gwen. <laughs> um, to give a comprehensive uh, look at work here in the, in the United States, I'm in the States, and, um, and that of what one presiding elder district, and I know she influences many more, uh, would give a perspective is presiding elder Rosetta Swinton. Um, there you are. We are in your hands. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm truly um, happy for the opportunity to share about the health ministry, my experience in the health ministry over these many years. I actually thought I would be out of it, but <laughs> I'm not. Um, I want to give on to um, Bishop Francine Brookins, our champion leader for the International Health Commission, to you, um, Dr. Burnett, for uh, allowing me to follow in your footsteps. There were, they are and will always be big footsteps to to fill. Um, I want to appreciate Dr. Natalie Mitchum for her work, as well as uh, Sister Gwen Williams for her many years of championship in this work. We appreciate all of you, your passion and for the hard work that you do um, to save lives. I also want to thank the, the previous presenters for the, the work that they have shared. Um, because their presentations have been very powerful. I too, I like this term of being um, volun, how do you call it? Voluntold to create a local uh, health ministry that started in my local church under uh, Reverend Robert Stokes, uh, the charity AME Church in Hugey, South Carolina. Uh, so I served as a, a health director at the local church. Then I was, um, sitting in a meeting, minding my own business, and uh, Reverend Dr. Alonzo Middleton, the presiding elder of the Mount Pleasant District, in a meeting said, oh, thank you so very much, Sister Swinton, for be, uh, agreeing to being the district health director. And I was like, what? <laughs> and then um, I was also made the Episcopal health director under the leadership of Bishop Henry Bielan. And currently I serve as the assistant uh, health director for the 20th district. So that has been my journey over these years. Uh, over the years, we learned a, a number of things um, that we considered very important through the health ministry. Um, some key lessons that we learned was first in the planning process of the health ministry. Uh, we learned that the health ministry could not just be based on people with health experience, but instead it needed to be inclusive. It needed to have people who had uh, experience in healthcare in the healthcare field, but we also needed other champions like the presidents of the different components. They needed to be invited. The Women's Missionary Society, the lay the president, Sons of Allen, Rayak, and even our YPD because we needed the young people to be involved. 
we, we learned that we needed people with media experience, computer experience, all of the skills that would be necessary to do the work because the focus was not just on, on health alone because there were other things that needed to be done, getting the message out, reaching people to be involved and, and look at the importance of health. And above all, um, the involvement of the pastors, the ministers, the presiding elders, the bishops were all very key um, to identify them as champions to help with the, the work of the health ministry to promote the importance of it. We also learned that everyone with healthcare experience did not actually want to serve in the health ministry. We had a number of physicians who they do that. They did that work all the time. So they wanted to, instead of doing health ministry in their local church or on their district level, or even on the annual conference level, they just wanted to sing in the choir or serve as an usher. So we also respected, respected that and, um, and would refer to them for guidance and advice in um, the various local church. We also learned that all churches did not even have a health professional. So we would rely on the pastor of the local church to identify someone who was passionate enough who could be the champion for that local church to help coordinate meetings and uh, help identify resources uh, that could be shared with the congregations. We also learned that it was important to always keep the health information available to people. So once a month, like when we started out at the Charity Amy Church in Hugey, the pastor gave me the opportunity once a month to share for about five minutes right after notices and announcements, a health tip. So once a month, there would be a health tip and that would, would always be something very important that helped people a lot. So even after the service, people could ask questions and get more information. We also learned that after forming the, the health ministry team, um, it was important to do a health needs assessment survey. And this was important to involve the congregation and helping to identify the health areas that the health ministry would actually address. Because, you know, as um, I can say for myself, as a, as a health professional, I can say, oh, I know, I know people need to eat healthy, they need to exercise, they need to do this and do that. But if, if the people, if the congregation you're serving do not see those um, areas as priorities and then you go and schedule an activity and no one shows up, <laughs> it's really your fault because you should have identified what do they want to know first. So we learn that if we can find out what people want to know about first and begin with that, we can add the other things later as they begin to have more interest in the importance of health. So that was one of the things that we learned how to do. So we requested all of our churches to do the um, health needs assessment. And then by doing that, the people were more um, inclined to participate and attend the events once they were, were organized. We also uh, discovered that key to the work of the ministry was partnership. Um, we needed to have partnership with the local hospitals, the local health department, um, even drug representatives, um, the American Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association, even the local Department of Health and other organizations. For example, uh, when we were identifying, we actually started with a health fair. So we identified there were a hundred people that were, um, their blood pressures were very high, but none of them really knew their blood pressures were high. So what we were able to do is partner with an organization who had gotten a grant to purchase blood pressure machines because we didn't have a budget. We couldn't buy machines. We wanted also our churches to be able to monitor blood pressures for their members. And so by partnering with them, they actually provided the free blood pressure machines and also provided nutrition workshops for our congregations. Another example of a partnership was the Medical University of South Carolina where we, we kicked off the Healthy AME project, which was very um, influential in making a huge impact across the, the, the state of South Carolina. We had 633 churches. So um, 
I think by the time I, I left South Carolina in 2008, about 400 of our churches already had a health ministry established. So this, for us to partner with the, with the Medical University of South Carolina for nutrition, for exercise, they also um, um, assisted us to have a website where people could go and get health information. We had the, the monthly health topics that we wanted um, all of the churches to focus on unless their congregation had a, a different topic they wanted to focus on. We worked on that. So healthy eating, um, healthy AME cookbook, um, other things like that were also made available. There we, we provided our goals, our objectives, the, the, um, how the health ministry should work. And then there were links to key um, health information and other resources on that website. So Healthy AME was one of those um, partnerships that were very important. We also learned that um, partnering with the drug representatives was also very helpful. Like again, we didn't have a budget. So when we wanted to address like mental health issues, we partnered with the drug company, a drug rep from Pfizer and they, they um, covered the expenses for the whole entire conference on mental health wellness. And it was a very powerful conference. Uh, and so we continue to have that. Also organizations like the American Heart Association, they worked with us. We established um, the Red Dress Sunday in our churches across uh, South Carolina, which was a very effective ministry. And then uh, another initiative we did was called the Whole Person Health Program. Uh, and the idea of the whole health program was to put the focus on the health ministry to not just focus on disease or other disorders. Uh, we wanted to focus on prevention. We wanted to focus on early detection, but we also wanted to address not only the physical and um, physical health and nutrition, but also education, social services needs, spiritual care and counseling, environmental health, mental um, mental wellness, as well as financial um, wellness as part of the ministry. So what we did, we organized to have a simultaneous um, whole person wellness day across the, the state so that every, uh, not every, but we chose three different, um, we chose the presiding elder district in each of the annual conference and people went to those venues. And when they arrived, they had all of these seven services provided for them where people can get more information and also get services. So we also knew that in every church, no one was gonna be an expert on all topics. So we also learned that we needed to have a speakers bureau so that if a church was wanted to have a speaker on HIV and AIDS or diabetes or any other topic, um, that we had the bureau there that people would volunteer and, and, and come and present. So our major focus was on prevention and early detection, uh, which were two of the, the key areas we focused on. And just like in the United States, uh, here in the 20th Episcopal District, we have lack of knowledge, we have lack of access to a lot of the services. So the 20th Episcopal District, uh, under the leadership of Bishop uh, Brailsford, we partnered with the University of South Carolina for them to come. They've done two mission trips here to provide medical um, services, dental care, eye care, because here, although the medical, um, I can say the medical care is free, but many times they don't have the medication. People are not able to afford eyeglasses. And the first time we ever did it, the um, when we did the eyeglasses, there was this one kid who had missed the day before going to school and he was like very serious about his learning and he was sad that he had missed the day before so the second day he said please let me go in front of the line I want to be first I don't want to miss my classes today so after getting the exam uh, the eye exam and they fitted him for his glasses they gave him this document to read and he said I can see I can see I can read now I can read now it was like one of those amazing experiences that we've had and so even for people who uh, were now able to get the eyeglasses free, you can hear people just testifying to say, now I can read my Bible. Now I can go home and read my Bible. So even something as small as that, uh, not having access 
is just the, the, like one of those same issues that we face in the United States. But we appreciate um, that we've had the opportunity to also have Dr. Jonathan um, Weaver, who also came. He's a, a pastor of the Greater Mount Nebo AME Church in um, Bowie, Maryland. He also brought a team to do um, a medical mission. But here in the um, Republic of Malawi, we know that the health disparities are still an issue. Um, and many of the health issues are a little bit different than in the States. But the, the same problem still exists where people have health issues, but they don't have access to the resources they need to get proper care. So we've seen people come off diabetic medication. We've seen people uh, drop their cholesterol levels through um, healthy eating, exercising. Even at our local church, we ended up having seven walking clubs because people had different times they wanted to walk. We provided chair exercises. We just involved everyone. Um, we did have one pastor because we were able to get pedometers. And um, each week, everybody would report how many steps they made. Um, and we had one pastor. He said, uh, I'll tell you how many steps I made, but I won't tell you where I went. But we, we had a lot of fun doing those projects. And it, it brought the, the, the congregation closer. And we also noted that by doing the health ministry, it also increased, it had an effect on increasing the membership at our local church because people were saying, if a pastor can care about our health, I think that's somebody who can really love us. And so many people actually joined churches just because of the health ministry. So we appreciate having had the opportunity to serve. There's so much more that we did, but that's just in a nutshell what I can share for now. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so very much. Uh, much of what I was going to say has uh, been added and uh, spoken of by both uh, uh, Exhorter Gwen Williams and uh, Presiding Elder Rosetta Swinton. And as our time is narrowing, what I would like to do is uh, just summarize where we're going. So we've talked about where we've been, We've talked about how we did things, and now let's talk about where we're going. Public health, as as uh, and I'll and I'll start where Presiding Elder Swinton left off. Uh, many of you all have heard me say that that public health is the framework for evangelism and ministry. All of the things that we have learned about. Uh, growing health ministries have actually taken to growing uh, uh, the, the church itself and more impactful how we relate to those who are with us in our communities. It's important to note that as public health transitions, it moves from treatment to prevention. We've talked about that the first hour and a half. It's also important to note that as, pro, as public health continues to move on, it moves from independent components and silos to systems and community and collaboration. So we must be able at this point in our lives to move to a place where our health ministries have all of the components, all of the work that we've done, Dr. Uh, Leonidas Berry in 1968 said that he, in 1940, he created a, a short chapter in the book entitled A Century of Missions of the AME Church. His father, Reverend L. Berry, was the secretary of missions at that time. He created an article called Opportunity of African Methodism in Medical Missions. His thought at that point was that we would use the medical and health ministry to move our churches forward. It reflected back to what was happening with uh, Bishop um, Allen, Richard Allen. And now we know that Richard Allen obviously had something going on. We know that uh, Dr. Leonidas Berry in his initial uh, report to the in 1940 
And then his report in 1946 that said that we must have a health commission. It did not come to fruition until 1992. I must steal a little bit of Bishop Francine's uh, Brookings thunder and say, we can't wait that long for this to grow to where we need it to be because our people are sick, our people are dying from, from lack of knowledge. We need to move the health commission forward so that those things can be addressed. The health commission has 14 ministries. Um, and of that, under the, the 14 ministries, there are others that uh, are, um, are multiple subcomponents under each ministry. 14 ministries being HIV, AIDS, caregivers, spiritual health, nutrition and exercise, mental health, differently abled, communicable disease and immunizations, website and social media, clergy and family health, chronic diseases, collaborations with other connectional agendas, death, dying and hospice, disaster preparedness and response, uh, substance abuse, addictions and recovery. Under um, nutrition and exercise is where our farm and garden program lies. It has also connections with the chronic disease, obviously. Under communicable disease and immunizations, we talk about Ebola, Zika, COVID, flu, um, HIV, AIDS in, 1990, in 2012. We were able to get it placed as a requirement, three hour required training every four years for the clergy and lay leadership. We do that training once a year. If, it, if others would like us to do it individually, we can do that as well. Um, webs, uh, individual presiding elder and or annual conferences, not one-on-one. -on -one. Um, website and social media, we have the amechealth.org, the website, we have Facebook. This will appear on both the uh, YouTube channel and the amechealth.org, as well as it is live streamed now to Facebook. We have a Twitter and we need a young person to do the Instagram for us because we don't have a clue what we're doing. Under clergy and family health, this is July Faith-Based Health Wellness Nutrition and Fitness Month. August is a month of rest, clergy and clergy family month where we give activities every month. Those will be posted um, next week. Chronic diseases, Alzheimer's and other dementias. We have partnerships with the Alzheimer's Association, heart disease, AM, um, with uh, heart disease associations around the world. We have partnerships World World Health Organization. I sit as a member of the World Council of Churches Health and Healing Consortium um, and will be presenting at the 11th assembly of the WCC meeting in September. Uh, disaster preparedness and response. We have um, many works, many have benefited from the work that has been done by this ministry uh, in disasters all around the world. We need your help. We need you um, and to spread the word that we need more hands as uh, illnesses, as prevention in particular continues, opportunities for prevention and education continue to grow. We need more hands, we need more feet. We need you all to spread the word. So please come and be a part of the health commission so that we can impact the very lives of the people we serve, both in our congregations and the communities that we are served. Richard Allen did not believe in the four walls of a church. He believed in getting out in the community. We are AMEs and the health commission is directly tied to being inside as well as outside of our four walls. COVID didn't teach us that, then we have not learned much. We must be outside the four walls for what happens to our neighbor happens to us as well. Bishop uh, Brookins, are you with us? I am. All right. If we will now ask you to uh, take us home. 
All right. Thank you. And greetings again to everyone and much appreciation to each of our presenters today. Um, as you can see, I changed my clothes into fitness clothes in order to accommodate the activities um, and, and the whole spirit of what we're trying to do here together today. Our ancestral traditions uh, teach us how to balance mental health, physical health, and spiritual health together. And we know that imbalances in our spiritual system can also create overall imbalances in our body. Sometimes a headache is actually a heartache and vice versa. These things are all connected in the same way that we are all connected together and any brokenness that happens in any part of us impacts all of us. Certainly we saw that and are continuing to see that when we look at the COVID situation that your breath is connected to my breath, is connected to somebody else's breath, and your health is connected to my health. This is actually physically true in addition to being spiritually true. In the last um, preceding season, it has felt like almost everything has tried to steal our joy the very joy of our salvation has even felt threatened from time to time as we continue to watch the mass shootings, the mass death, the impacts of climate change on our communities and the unaddressed mental health issues combining together to create storms that are hard to navigate especially as people who are called to bring health and healing in the midst of sickness and death and depression. So I wanna offer you two scriptures and a prayer today as we send off into this new season with great expectation of how God will continue to use the tremendous gifts and talents that God has brought together through the AME Church Health Commission, involving all of us in African Methodism and truly all of us together in this world. Breath has no denomination. Nehemiah 8 and 10. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, Reverend Dr. Mitchum, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And Proverbs 17, 22. A cheerful heart is a good medicine, but a downcast spirit dries up the bones. Let us pray. I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me. Agree with me. We're all a part of God's body. It is God's will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. I need you to survive. I pray for you. You pray for me. I love you. I need you to survive. I won't harm you with words from my mouth or breath from my unmasked self. I love you. I need you to survive. God, we need you in order to survive, to continue to serve and to spread your healing throughout the church and the land. I pray now 
that you would infuse every servant who has had their joy depleted with a fresh dose of joy. Give us laughter, give us humor, give us joy bubbles in our bellies where we have had anxiety and fear and stress and even death. Give us back our joy and let it be the strength that we need in order to carry on and heal the land. We thank you, God. We praise you. We magnify you for the ancestors who brought us, for those who serve now, and for those who are on the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Natalie, for the presentations of earlier uh, this, this, uh, this day. Thank you, um, Exhorter Gwen and Presiding Elder Rosetta for your life's work, for your continued life's work. And thank you for volunteering me. <laughs> we'll carry on the legacy. That's right. I've got, I've got it down pat, Gwen. You're I've got this volunteer thing down pat. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Have a blessed rest of your day, service tomorrow. Um, this has been good. It's been helpful. It's been encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.